typewrite Mozart for babies and YouTube comes up with an endless amount of videos with music of Mozart, specially meant for baby ears, revealing the popularity of the Mozart effect. The myth of the first three years is the claim that during the first three years of life, the brain undergoes a rapid increase in synaptic connections and brain connections, that this period of rapid growth and connectivity is the critical period in brain development, and that it is during this critical period that environmental enrichment has the most permanent and long-lasting effects. Okay, now one of the areas that's most talked about uh, in early childhood and brain development is the effect of music on development, and this is most typically known as the Mozart effect. Uh, it's interesting that when this effect was discovered back in the mid-1990s, the research was done on college students. Um, and the researchers found that if college students listened to Mozart for a moment, uh, uh, for maybe 10 or 15 minutes after listening, they uh, showed improved performance on spatial reasoning tasks. Uh, on the basis of that experiment, governors around the country decided there was a Mozart effect, uh, whereby playing Mozart or classical music for infants would somehow uh, build better brain. An American, Don Campbell, pretend to the solution for the development of the cerveau des bébés. La musique de Mozart. De passage à Montréal pour mousser ses livres et ses CD, il tente de convaincre les parents. L'éducation commence des mois avant la naissance. La musique et les sons aident à stimuler et à développer le cerveau. L'écoute de la musique de Mozart va accélérer le développement du cerveau du bébé? Absolument. La musique favorise la prononciation, la respiration et aussi le contexte par lequel se forme le langage. Et également à développer toutes les capacités émotionnelles. Les CD de Don Campbell se vendent si bien qu'il a lancé une collection exclusivement pour bébés. Uh, we do have to do a lot for our children, but we shouldn't think uh, that if we do it all by age three, we don't have to do any more, or that if our children, for some reason, do not develop normally or have bad experiences before they're three, uh, that they're going to be damaged forever. It's just not that simple. It's much more complex. There's nothing wrong with saying that the first three years are an important part of life. That's true. Uh, a lot of fundamental aspects of development occur then, and uh, they require certain kinds of experience. What's wrong is to say that it's all over at the end of three years, and, and that's the myth. The myth is that once the first three years have passed, you've gone out of the window and experience can no longer affect the structure of the brain. That's simply not true. What we've shown, at least in rats, is, and, and I think this has got to be true for humans as well, is that at any point in life, out to at least middle age and, and, and even beyond that, the structure of the brain remains amenable, remains changeable by experience. <laughs> Rapid synapse growth does occur after birth, but it's not caused by the environment. It's caused by our genetic program. Um, what is very important in development that is lost in the popular message uh, is the, the loss of these synapses. Uh, so the message going out to parents that early stimulation causes synapses to grow or brain connections to grow and that the trick in being a good parent is to make as many of these early synapses survive into adulthood as they can is really misleading. The growth of the fetal brain in the womb is enormous. The nerve cells multiply at an awesome rate, 500,000 cells every minute, to about 200 billion after the first few months. They are in fact overproduced a biological insurance policy, about half of these cells simply die on. For the half that survives, the job is just beginning. They stay for the rest of your life. Each nerve cell, or neuron, 
can make anywhere between 1 to 10,000 connections with other nerve cells. If the connections are correct and are being used, they get strengthened. If they are not being used or only being used occasionally, they are lost. We can call it use it or lose it. So the fetal brain is really a dynamic structure that's constantly changing in response to this process of strengthening appropriate connections and pruning inappropriate connections. The people in the United States who've been emphasizing or perhaps even overemphasizing the importance of the first three years of life use three basic scientific arguments. The first argument that they use is that critical periods exist. This is true. There are times when the brain needs certain information if development is to continue normally. The second argument that they use is that synapses are overproduced but then lost in development. That's true too, but the loss of synapses is an important part of development. The brain, as best we understand it, would function much less well if it kept those synapses than if it lost them. The third argument, and I think the greatest misinterpretation, has to do with my own research, which uh, has shown that animals that are exposed to a complex environment make more synapses in a number of different parts of the brain. What we see here is an experiment like the one that we performed in the 1970s. Young rats that really first could just leave their mother were put into a complex environment that was filled with a set of toys that changed on a daily basis. The goal of this experiment was to see what happened in the brain. It was really the first time anyone had ever done this at the microscope level, to see what kinds of changes occurred in the brain when animals grew up in a complex, uh, more or less naturalistic surrounding. This is our attempt to replicate uh, a sewer in New York City, or a forest in Iowa that rats might choose to make their home. What we discovered is that when rats grew up from weaning in this environment, their brains were fundamentally altered. Nerve cells had larger dendritic fields, uh, and those dendritic fields had more synapses upon them. So nerve cells basically had more connections, lots more connections, if the animals grew up like this than if the animals grew up in a standard laboratory cage. Very early Mozart. Here what we have are very young animals, um, the equivalent of human children. What was interesting is later in still the 1970s, we did the same experiment, but we used adult animals. Those adult animals uh, showed essentially the same response. You get basically the same benefit. They form new connections, not quite as many, not quite as fast, but they, they basically do the same thing in the brain. So that the idea that there's a window of opportunity after which that window is shut and experience has no further effect simply is not what these experiments say. They say there's a window that may be really open, it may close a little bit across time, but it doesn't shut by any means. The world definitely did not expect to see adult animals having these kinds of plastic changes in their brain. It was surprising to many people that even a, a young rat could add dendrite and add new synapses to the brain. The thought that a mature adult rat could do the same thing was truly shocking. Um, to the majority of the scientific world. This microscopic footage shows living brain neurons. A piece of a brain the size of a grain of rice contains about 10,000 nerve cells. Unlike other cells in the body, neurons don't regenerate. Once they die, they are gone forever. We know that a child's brain recovers faster than an adult's brain 
because a child's brain is much more elastic, more resilient. On the left, brain neurons of a young animal are shown. On the right, the neurons of an older animal. For both animals, the branches of the neurons are cut at the same time. Notice on the left side the speed with which the young neurons reconnect. The young brain's ability to rewire itself quickly might explain why learning on a younger age often seems so effortless. Here we see in close-up two neurons sprouting fibers and establishing a new connection or synapse, permitting to pass signals from one to the other. Such dynamic brain processes invalidate previous notions about the brain's static and hardwired character. For the last 15 years at the McDonald Foundation here, we've been funding research on education, child development, and brain science. And we were quite surprised when we saw press releases saying that there were big breakthroughs in brain science that were about to revolutionize early childhood because we thought we should have known about it and we should have funded some of that research. So we looked into it a bit more deeply and found that a lot of the claims that were being made in the policy literature were really not that well-founded. Uh, that's sometimes understandable, where the political rhetoric gets out ahead of the science. We didn't think about it much more until uh, we started getting calls from parents uh, who were wondering what brain science could tell them about choosing, say, a preschool for their child. We have no idea what happens when we play classical music for an infant. We haven't done that exper experiment, nor has anybody else. Uh, so there's, there's a variety of these products out there. And in one sense, I suppose, uh, they do no harm. Uh, children uh, should listen to music, can listen to music. Uh, Brazilian lullabies are probably as appropriate or would uh, a good rhythm and blues album. But this is one of those instances where good intentions and a bad understanding of the science got way out in front of the policy. Le Dr. Brazelton a animé des émissions de télévision durant des années aux États-Unis. Il a écrit de nombreux best-sellers portant sur les soins à donner aux bébés. Ses recherches, c'est d'abord le résultat de 35 ans de pratique dans sa clinique de Boston et les 25 000 bébés qui y sont passés. You offer a baby a toy about three parts of the brain go on like that in a small baby this is. And with a, when, when the mother speaks to that baby or imitates that baby and the baby responds back to her, the whole brain lights up. I think we have the least cared for babies that we've ever had. Mothers are not, you know, really looking in a baby's face and saying, you matter to me. And every time a baby looks at her and smiles or vocalizes, she ought to be there to, f to look right back at him. That's where development really starts. And if a mother thinks by playing Mozart, that's all she needs to do for a baby, that's tragic. If, on the other hand, when she plays Mozart, she gets in there and dances with her baby and they sing together, it's wonderful. So it depends on how these things are used. But why Mozart? You think, you think there's think a good reason for it? <laughs> no, I don't. You don't, huh? <laughs> I think that kind of research is biased in all likelihood. Thank you.